Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. Verses 7 through 14. Philippians 3, verses 7 through 14. It says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after it that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I cannot myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting any of those things which are behind, and reaching forth into those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We've been looking at a principle of life on Sunday nights, and today we're going to look at the principle of concentration. The principle of concentration. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and grace. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your house tonight, to worship you, to learn from your word. Help us, Lord, to allow your Holy Spirit uh, to work on us, uh, to draw us closer to you, and that we'll be ready for this week uh, to live a life that honors your name and points others to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And so uh, tonight we're going to look at the concent- uh, the principle of concentration, or you can use the word focus, right? The principle of focus. We must keep our eyes fixed on the prize and not allow anything to distract us. The world has plenty to distract us. Our enemies will throw things at our li- in our lives that will distract us from our mission. And our mission is to preach the gospel. That's our mission. Our mission is to fulfill the Great Commission. And the devil don't like that. Our flesh doesn't even like that. And the world wants to draw us away from that. And so we have to learn how to keep our eyes fixed on the ultimate goal. And the ultimate goal is when we leave this world to be involved in the Great Commission. Talking to people about the Lord. So how can we do that? I'm going to give you four things tonight. I probably won't be long, but I won't be as short as last week. So don't, don't get happy on me. I'll be a little bit longer than last week. Can I tell the story, Sister Susie? So we was preaching and uh, uh, Sarah Fina said, is that it? When I got done, she was like, is that it? That's all he's got tonight? And so I got a little bit more for you tonight than I did last week, right? And so I want to make it worth your all's time to get in your cars in the chilly air and come to the house of God and hear from the Word of God. And so if you look over at Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29 is one of my favorite verses. Maybe one of your all's favorite verses. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Number one, where we are looking will determine where we go. Where we are looking will determine where we go. This verse says, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord. So God is talking to his people. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. God has an expected end for all of his children. And so that's what we should be looking towards. What, what is that end that God has for us? What, what is that purpose that, that God has for us? Now, we know one purpose is for all of us. That's the Great Commission. That, that's all of us. That's the purpose for the church. And we make up the church, each individual. And so that is one purpose. But, but God has a specific purpose for you and I within that mission. Right, so, so within that mission of the Great Commission, there's a purpose, a specific purpose for each one of us. 
right? And that's what we're supposed to be focused on. What do you want me to do in a Great Commission? How do you want me to be involved in the Great Commission? Where, where do you want me to be uh, in your army, right? Because we are in the Lord's army, right? We're marching forward for the Lord, right? We, have to, we can't forget that he has an expected end for us, right? Now, if you lose sight of that, and you're not looking towards that way. You're going to be looking towards a different way. And whatever way you're looking, that's the way you're going to go. So if you're looking towards the things of you and what you want, that's the way you're going to go. If you're looking towards the things of the world, that's the way you're going to go. But if you're looking towards what does God have for me and you're looking towards that way and you're focused on that, that's the way you're going to go. Right? We have to decide which way do I want to go. Do I, do I want to go the way of God or do I want to go a different way? Right, and each person makes that choice which way they want to go. Look over at Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. And look at verse number three. It says, Commit thy works to the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. You know, one way to make sure that you're going the right direction is to commit your works to him, right? Commit your ways to him. Uh, commit your doings uh, to the Lord, and he, you will stay focused on going his way. You will stay focused on going the direction that God wants you to go. But if you don't commit your works to the Lord, then guess what? You'll go a different way because you'll be focused on whatever you're committed to, right? And only, only you and the Lord know what you're committed to tonight. Right? I do know this, that for us as God's people, if you're saved tonight, God wants you, you to be committed to him and his will, his purpose for your life. Look over at, at Nehemiah. Let's go back before the book of Job and look at Nehemiah 6. I knew we were going to Nehemiah. I mentioned it this morning. I just couldn't remember which message it was. Nehemiah 6, verses 2 through 3, says that Sambalat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messages unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should this work cease? Was I leave it? And come down to you, right? These these men, Sambalat and Geshem, they were trying to uh, get uh, Nehemiah to lose his focus, to lose his focus of the work, right? God called him to do a work. What was the task? Y'all know what the task was? To rebuild what? The walls. the walls of Jerusalem. That was the task, and he was he was on task. He was focused on the work that God gave him to do. But Sambalat and Gisha said, let's, let's make him lose his focus. Let's discourage him, right? Let's, let him, let's cause him to drift away from what God wants him to do, right? Thankfully, Nehemiah uh, was sensitive to know, you know what? They're, they're not right. They're, they're trying to lead me in the wrong way. And so he said, no, I'm not going to come down. Y'all see where, what plane they were in? The plane of oh no. You see, y'all see that? Oh no, right? And guess what? When, when the enemy comes, it's like, oh no. Right? We're in the plane of oh no. And the enemy's coming, right? Guess what? Nehemiah did right. He kept his focus on the task that God gave him to do. Guess what? We have a task to reach as many people in Gallatin as we can. And we need to knock on as many doors in Gallatin as we can. That's going to be the goal this year. We're going to knock on as many doors as possible and talk to as many people as possible. Why? Because many people need the Lord and many people need to be saved. Look at Romans 15. Romans 15 and verse number four. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Guess what? Focus on where your hope comes from. Your hope don't come from yourself. Your hope doesn't come from your spouse, unless your spouse gives you a scripture, right? Our hope doesn't come from the government. 
it ever will come from the government, right? Here, the verse, the verse 4 says, the comfort of the scriptures might have what? Hope. The, this book is where we get our hope from. This book is where we get our guidance from. Right. This book is where we get our comfort from, our encouragement from, our strength from. The Bible says to strengthen the inward man. Right? And so we're supposed to, we, we can keep our focus by uh, focusing on the book, on the Word of God, because the Word of God gives us hope. Right? If you lose your focus of this book, you'll lose your hope. If you lose your focus of this book, you'll lose your focus of what God has for you to do. Look at Philippians 3 again. Philippians 3, and we're going to look at 12 through 14. It says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So verse 12, I'm going to stop there because it says, in the middle of that verse, it says, but I follow after. Follow after who? Christ. His will. His, his purpose for my life and his purpose for your life. Right, Paul was focused. He was following after the Lord. And he did that his whole ministry. And he, he faced many things that we have never faced. He, he almost lost his life many times. He was in prison multiple times. Right? Guess what? Brother, I never lost my life for the gospel. Not even close. I never, I've never been thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, specifically for preaching the gospel. That's why Paul was put in prison, for preaching the the gospel. Guess what? They didn't like it back then, and they don't like it now. When you preach on Jesus, they don't like it. When you preach on, hey, he, there's only one way to go to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. People don't like that. Why? Because they think that they have their own way to go to heaven. Well, guess what? The Bible says they're wrong. The Bible says that Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man could follow but by me. You have to go through Jesus, and, and the world doesn't like that, right? And they put the Apostle Paul in prison for preaching that, right? Guess what? That can happen in our country. It's happened in other countries to preach that Jesus is the only way. You can preach on God, but don't preach on Jesus. And so Paul followed after uh, the Lord. Verse 13, brethren, I cannot myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. So he didn't focus on the past. He didn't focus on the times that he uh, was suffering for the Lord. No, he focused on the future. He focused on uh, uh, going forward for Christ and preaching Jesus Christ. Uh, preach those, uh, those things which are behind, reaching forth those things which are before, right? Going forward for the Lord, not backwards. Verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Guess what? Paul was always pressing. He was always pressing forward. That's number one. Number two, don't focus on other runners in the race. Don't focus on other runners in the race. Because if you're, if you are a marathon runner, you are not focusing on the guy that you're trying to beat. If you focus on the guy that you're trying to beat, you could trip, you can fall, and you'll lose the race completely. No, what are they focused on? They're focused on their race. They're focused on their lane. They're focused on reaching what? The finish line. That's what they're focused on. So don't focus on other runners in the race. Look over at John 21. John 21 and verse 21 and 22. Says Peter, seeing him say to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Look at verse 22. Jesus said to him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. So Peter was concerned about someone else, right? He, he was watching <laughs> someone else, right? And Jesus said, no, don't do that. You, you, you stay in your lane, right? You, you follow what? Me. Right? He's going to follow me, and you follow me. Jesus says, it's none of your business what he's doing. It's your business to follow me. People will compare themselves to other Christians. Well, I'm doing more than that person. 
I'm doing, that person's not doing nothing, so I'm, I'm in better shape. Well, no, that's, that's the wrong answer, right? We're supposed to focus on our walk with the Lord and our relationship with him and our race, right? Not other people. That's between them and the Lord. Now, if I preach something that hits you, that's not me focusing on you. That, that's me focusing on the Bible, right? If the Bible hits us, that's whose fault? That's ours, right? We have to get that right with the Lord. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And look at verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. It says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, measure, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not what? Why? Said, hey, don't Paul is teaching the church at Corinth, don't compare your walk with other people's walk. Don't compare your service to other people's service. That's what he's saying. Look over at Galatians chapter one. Galatians chapter one and verse number ten. It says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, men, I should not be the servant of Christ. That's telling us the motive of our walk and our service. It's not to please others. It's to please who? The Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. Look at chapter 6 and verse 4 of Galatians. But let every man... Prove his own work, and then shall he have, have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. I share these verses with you because it's all talking about we're not supposed to compare ourselves to other people. We're not supposed to measuring, measure ourselves to other people. Brother Larry's not my measuring stick. And I'm not Brother Larry's measuring stick. This is my measuring stick. This alone. This is Brother Larry's measuring stick. This is everyone here's measuring stick, right? This book is the only thing that, that measures us. And because and, you won't give an account to the Lord based on me. You'll give an account to the Lord based on this and this alone. So number one, how do we uh, stay cons- uh, focused is we are looking, our, where we are looking, we determine where we go. Number two, don't focus on other runners in the race. Number three, don't stop looking to Jesus. Don't stop looking. Look at Matthew 14 and verse 30. Don't stop looking to Jesus. It says, but when he saw the wind boisterous, <clears throat> lost my place, and he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, Save me. Who, who, is, who is talking there? Mm-hmm. Peter. Where was, what was Peter doing? He was walking on the water. He was actually walking on the water. Brother Larry, have you ever walked on the water? In it? Yeah, me too. I walked in it. I never walked on the water. <coughs> Peter was walking on the water. Just think about that. He was walking on the water. The one that denied Christ three times. The one that acted like a lost person so that people wouldn't know he was following Jesus. He walked, how did he walk on the water? He kept his eyes on the Lord. He had faith in Jesus. When did Peter start to sink? When he took his eyes off the Lord. He was no longer looking to Jesus. Guess guess when you and I will sink in this life? When we take our eyes off the Lord and we're no longer looking to him. Guess what? In the storm, and you go through a storm, as long as you keep your eyes on Jesus, you're not going to sink during the storm. I don't believe that that day was just a calm day and the water was calm and, and, and peaceful like you go to a river and you go fishing in a river and the water's just nice and peaceful. There's not even a ripple. No, I believe that day there was waves. I believe that day there was a storm. And I believe that Peter was walking on those waves, going to Jesus in the storm. But I believe that he took his eyes off the Lord because he got afraid. 
He got afraid in the storm and there was lightning all around him. There was big waves trying to swallow him up and the storm got to Peter and he took his eyes off the Lord and he started to sink. But Jesus reached down and rescued him and picked him up out of, the, out of his sinking state. But guess what? He, while he was in the storm and everything was good, even though he was in the storm, he had his eyes on the Lord. Guess what? We, we can go through storms of life. We can go through trials and, and horrible sick circumstances. But as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we won't sink. But if I take my eyes off the Lord, I'm going to sink. Right? If you take your eyes off the Lord, you're going to sink. Right? When I was, I'll be honest with you. When I was in the ER on Friday, I got a bit, a bit scared. I really did. I got a bit scared. I got a bit nervous. I had a little bit of anxiety. Right now, it ended up being good news and nothing bad. But I still had a little bit of anxiety. I'm sure um, other people have had that. Other Christians have had that. We're still human. But for a little bit, I took my eyes off the Lord because I got a little bit anxious. Right? As a Christian, I shouldn't get anxious. I shouldn't, I shouldn't get scared. But that human nature inside of me sort of took over. Right? Ever, ever been there? When that human nature just takes over, you're like, man, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I was actually thinking, what's wrong with me? How come I, I, I couldn't stop crying? I was crying. I was anxious. And I, I couldn't understand what's going on. And she prayed with me. And, and the Lord just, he calmed me down. But I still had an anxious part. I took my eyes off the Lord for a little bit, right? And I started to sink. Right? I'm sure I'm not the only one. But we sink when we let our human emotions take over. We sink, right? If I keep my eyes on the Lord, everything's peaceful. Everything's fine. But take my eyes off the Lord, it's not going to be. Look at Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19 and verse 4. It says, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagle's wings, and brought you unto myself. Guess what? We had the testimony of the word of God, of all the things that God has done. And all the things that was human, humanly impossible that God did. We also have our own testimony of things in our past that, that God did and that God came through. Those are testimonies that we have either of ourselves or other men and women from the word of God had those testimonies. That we can, we can keep looking to Jesus and not sink, right? Look over at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 33. And look at verse 27. It says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. Look at that. The eternal God is thy refuge. The eternal God. Then it goes on, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Can the everlasting arms drop anything? Can the everlasting arms fail? They can't, right? That's who you can look to. You can look to him because he's everlasting. He always has been and he always will be. He's everlasting. You can look to him. Look at, at Psalm 18. Psalm 18. And verse 35. It says, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Right? As you're going through life, you have the right hand of God to hold you up. You can look to him because guess what? His right hand has never, ever failed. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And starting at verse number 1 says, God, 
who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by him purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again when he bringeth in the for First begotten into the world, he saith, and let the, all the angels of God worship him. And so in verse uh, number three, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. How did he create everything that you see? He spoke it into existence. Everything that you see, he spoke it. Why are we here? On this earth, he spoke man into existence. Then he took a rib and made woman, right? The sun that you see, you didn't see it today because it was cloudy, but the sun that is there is still there, even though it's cloudy outside. The, the sun, God spoke it into existence. The moon, if you can see it, God spoke it into it. All the stars in the sky, God spoke it into existence. Everything that you see, he spoke it. So if he has that kind of power, to speak whatever he wanted to existence. Guess what? Can you not look to him? Can you not look to him when trouble comes? When trials come? When discouragement comes? Can you, can you not look to the all-powerful one? Right? We serve an all-powerful God. He is all-powerful. We serve a God that can do anything. Anything. We're praying for Sister Julia. Guess what? God can reach down and heal her. I told the family, it's really in, it's in God's hands. We could pray, but it's in God's hands. What, what happens, it's in God's hands. And we have to trust the Lord with whatever happens. It does. And I, I know Sister Julie is at peace with that. I know that she is. I'm praying that the family will be at peace with that as well. Number four, if we don't lose focus, we won't make changes that take us away from the truth. If we don't lose focus, and our focus is supposed to be where? On the things of God, on the word of God, on, on what God has for us to do. That's what our focus is supposed to be on. If we don't lose focus, we won't make changes that take us away from the truth. If you look over at Hebrews 2, you should already be in Hebrews 1. Hebrews 2, verse 1, says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Guess what? If, if, you, if you don't give heed, right? Another word, I guess you could say, if you don't pay attention, right? If you, don't, if you don't take heed to what the Word of God says, you'll forget it. You'll forget about it. You'll forget to uh, make it a part of your life, your everyday life, right? We're supposed to read this book every day, right? That's why we got the schedule back there on the table to give you something, a tool, uh, to use to keep you on track you don't have to use that tool there's other tools that you can use or in our devotion book there's a little reading schedule at the bottom of each devotion that would uh, help you read your bible through in a year uh, i had had one out last year that we used that had different way to read the bible through in a year so there's little there's tools that you can use to stay in the book every day right and it's not it's not huge you're not reading you're not reading a book in a day right you're you're reading chapters in a day to keep you on track with the Lord. Look at Acts 17. Acts 17 and verse 11. It says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Are you searching the scriptures daily? Where those things are so. Do you read your Bible every day? I mean, guess what? When you read it every day, there's things in your life that you can say, you know what? That shouldn't be there. That, that doesn't belong. That's going to cause me to, to lose focus. That's going to cause me to get out of the race, to get out of the, off the fiery line. Look over at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll close with that. 1 
First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Because when I'm preaching God's word, you're not, you're not receiving what Brother Sean says. What Brother Sean says is important. You're receiving the word of God, the message that is preached from this pulpit. You're receiving it. If you receive it, guess what it, guess, look what it does. The last part of verse 13 says, which effectually, effectually worketh also in you. When you receive God's word, it works in you. It molds you. It gives you the mind of Christ. It changes your life. It directs you. It helps you to be more like Jesus. Right? When you receive it. If you don't receive it, then you're, you're not going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So we're going to close with that. It's time for our application. So I'm going to ask some questions. And don't answer out loud, but just answer inside where you're at with these questions. Number one, am I keeping my focus on Christ and moving forward for him? Where are you at? Are you focusing on Jesus tonight? Is right now in, in your current life, are you focusing on the Lord? Are you moving forward for Jesus? Number two, is pleasing and obeying the Lord my central focus in life? Is pleasing and obeying the Lord my central focus in life? Number three, does the way I spend my time, talent, and money reflect a focus on God or on something else? So think about your time. Think about how you spend your time, how you use your talents, how you spend your money, and that will give you what your focus is, right? Is it on the things of God or the things of the world? Number four, have I fallen into the habit of evaluate, evaluating and critiquing others rather than myself, right? We're not supposed to look at others, not supposed to look at their race, not supposed to look at their walk. We're supposed to focus on ours. We're, guess what? Don't we have enough to evaluate in ourselves? Don't we have enough to critique ourselves? Guess what? We should be our best, our best critic, right? Because we know ourselves better than anybody. We should, we should be evaluating ourselves and critiquing ourselves ourselves, not others, right? And they shouldn't be critiquing us as well. We should do that to ourselves. Number five, am I committed to serving God no matter what comes? Am I committed to serving God no matter what comes? No matter what. Come what may, we're going to serve the Lord. Number six, have I allowed changes to what I believe and do because of a loss of focus? Have I allowed changes to what I believe and do because of a loss of focus. When you lose focus, it can, it can cause damage. It can, it can cause chaos in your life when you lose focus. When you're not living Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 14, it, it can cause chaos in your life. Number seven, am I looking to God as my ultimate source of supply and approval? Am I, am I depending upon the Lord? I'm not living for others' approval. I'm living for His approval, Right? Guess what? Some people will say, you're too close to Jesus. Guess what I say to that? You can never be too close to Jesus, right? You, you, read, you talk about your Bible too much. You can never talk about your Bible too much. You pray too much. No, you can never pray too much. You have joy. How can you, have, how can you be joyous all the time, right? We should be joyful all the time, right? We, the Bible says we should uh, be thankful for what? All things. The Bible says we should pray how much? Without ceasing, right? We can never do anything spiritually too much. Guess what? Can you witness too much? Can you invite people to church too much, right? There's nothing spiritual that you can do too much, right? And so we uh, have to keep our focus on the things of the Lord, and that will keep us in the fight. That, that will keep us on track this year. Guess what? Uh, a year goes by fast, but, it, but there's a lot in a year. Right? There's a lot in a year. There's 365 days. But guess what? You can lose sight of 365 days really quick if you don't focus on the things of the Lord. Please stand with me. Close in a word of prayer.